So we hear a lot about different types of testing. We have the PCR tests, we have rapid tests. What are the differences between those kinds of tests? So are rapid tests the same as serological tests, for example? Uh, thank you very much for the, um, for the question. Uh, thank you for having us here. I think there is a very important space uh, to explain a little about this uh, situation with the tests. Uh, yes, actually, uh, the, 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 the molecular test is what we call the PCR. Uh, it's, um, it's a test uh, what, that, that we use to detect the, um, the nucleic acid of the virus. That means the genetic information of the virus. So uh, whenever we detect the, by, by PCR this, um, this um, genetic material, uh, it's a confirmation that the virus is actually present in the sample. On the other hand, we had the, the, what we call the rapid tests. Rapid tests, uh, we have to differentiate between two different kind of rapid tests. We have some rapid tests that are actually designed to detect some uh, parts of the virus, the, what we call some, the antigens, some proteins of the virus. And when we detect the proteins of the virus, it means that actually the virus is, is present in the, in the sample. And on the other hand, we have the, the rapid tests, uh, which are the, um, actually uh, designed to detect antibodies. The antibodies are like the immunological um, track that, that someone was infected, but uh, we cannot know if uh, the virus is present in this, at the same time or when in the time was actually the person in contact with the virus. So um, and the difference is um, that depending on the moment of the infection, we can detect either the virus during the first eight days and after that, since eight days and, uh, and, forward and onward, we can detect the antibodies. Okay, so, so with the PCR tests, that allows us to detect when someone's ill, even when they're not showing symptoms. And the, the rapid tests allow us to see if someone's had the disease, is that correct? Exactly, the, the, the PCR actually allows us to, det to detect and to demonstrate, to confirm, that the virus is present in the, in the patient or in the individual. Yes. Okay. And Analia, when should each test be used? Well, um, it's, it's kind of a follow-up of what Jairo was explaining. So, uh, if we agree that the PCR is able to detect the virus when it's in your body, reproduce it. So, that's the one that's going to tell you you are sick or not. So, that's the definite answer to by lab to decide if a patient is undergoing an active infection and why do we want to know that we want to know that because either we can provide the right treatment to that patient but also we can take measures such as isolating that patient uh, or isolating the contacts doing public health measures that would prevent further spread that's why we insist so much that uh, you know uh, the PCR test is the gold standard for diagnosing the, the disease because it allows us to answer uh, yes or no if a patient is undergoing an active infection. The other tests, which are the serological tests, are very valuable, but for different uses, not for diagnosis. What these tests are usually used for is what we call serological surveys for epidemiological studies. So as a Ministry of Health wants to answer uh, certain questions is how many beds do I need? How much my community has been impacted? Uh, how should I plan for the future? How many people are susceptible? These serological samples, which are small or large community, is tested to see how many effectively have undergone through an infection, yes? That's what the serological test can very handy. And also another good use of the serological surveys is to then calculate the overall impact in terms of death and infection rate. So it's not the same, uh, if we, we need to assess the real number of people infected to then extrapolate the percentage of people that get severe cases or ultimate death. So that's why we need those tests. Okay. And Haido, so what, what you and, and Dr. Porras have been saying is that 
the PCR tests work when someone is when someone isn't showing symptoms. The rapid tests they won't work when someone's showing symptoms. Then is that the case? Mm, the thing is like when either if the person actually has symptoms has symptoms, uh, the rapid test actually doesn't mean that what you are infected with is COVID nineteen. So you can have, for instance, you can have contact with COVID like 20 days ago, 20, 20 days ago. So you can have right now the antibodies. But now, for instance, if you are infected with influenza, you're going to have the symptoms of influenza, but you're going to have antibodies for COVID. So that's why it's not useful for, the, for diagnosis or for confirmation doing it with antibodies while the, the PCR actually confirms that you actually have the, 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 the virus in your body, as Analia was saying, that is actually replicating in your body and you can detect it in the sample that, that, that you're getting. Mm. And if a person has never, has had COVID-19, but has never shown any symptoms, then why do, we, why do we want to know if they've been exposed by the virus? Why is that important information to get? Uh, actually, uh, I'm going to start and I'm going to leave the floor to, to, to Analia. But the, the most important thing is like, um, we are not recommending to, to, um, to, to, to detect or to test in asymptomatic uh, persons. Because as you said, any soul that we have actually is not going to guide anything and is going to say anything because if, if you are negative, you don't know if it is because just you are in a, in a moment of the contact with the virus where you cannot detect anything, or if definitely because you haven't had contact with the virus. So it's pretty much, um, yeah, it's, not you, it's not actually useful to, to make any kind of, um, of test. So in the community, it would be important uh, for um, other kind of epidemiological uh, research to know how many people in, uh, in an area actually can be infected. So this is probably something that Analia may um, complete a little bit more. No, so that's why uh, it's, th there are several layers to deciding what tests you should apply. But the, we're going to be repeating during this interview and on and on for diagnosis of a specific case as a patient level. The PCR test is the choice test for uh, determine if someone is undergoing a, a, an active infection. But why do you want to diagnose? So this is the, I think it's linked to your question. If you are uh, someone who uh, is actively undergoing the disease and have symptoms of different grade, you want to be tested. Why? Because there are things you need to do, whether it's for your own care, receiving the proper medical care, or also to protect others in the community not to get infected. So that's the public health measures. And that's why it's so important that people that are undergoing COVID symptoms get tested. Yeah. But if you are asymptomatic, there's no reason because you can be either asymptomatic because you have no disease or because at that time you're showing. So it's, you cannot catch the virus unless we show symptoms. Okay. Uh, and, and so that's why we not uh, suggest that everybody gets a, uh, except very few um, might be situations in certain cases for healthcare workers or certain very particular uh, important uh, and, and specific cases, the people that should get tested with a PCR are the ones that are going, uh, undergoing symptoms that are compatible. I think Cairo pointed out something that's very, very important. People get sick of other things during this pandemic. So people in the hemisphere that may go in influenza might have influenza. And it's a different set of treatment for that. So you want to make sure that person doesn't have influenza. People in the South right now are undergoing in some countries dengue uh, episodes. So some of the symptoms are very similar at the beginning of the disease. And you definitely want to make a differential diagnosis, and that's why you want to get tested. And that's, that's the part that we want to uh, underline is uh, why it's so important that just symptomatic people get the test, because it allows you to make, take action, to take measures. Uh, for the rest, we insist that the best 
uh, way forward is the public health measures, the social distancing, the, the following what your government has determined as the base cause of action to forego, I mean, to, to either, um, you know, prevent or at least slow the spread of the disease in your own community. Okay. Uh, you've, you've both reiterated, uh, I heard it in the Spanish interview this morning and, and you're doing it in the, in the English interview this afternoon, that PCR tests are really the, the gold standard that we're promoting here at the Pan American Health Organization. Um, Haido, since the, the end of February this year, PAPA has carried out training in laboratories throughout Latin America and the Caribbean to train personnel in testing for COVID-19. I'm assuming this was utilizing PCR tests then. Can you explain to us a little bit about that training and what, and what we did? Yeah, actually, um, it was a very important process because once we had available the, the, the sequence of the virus, of the first virus that actually we had information in like three or four uh, days, uh, this protocol um, was released by the Charité University Hospital uh, Germany. Uh, that was actually the, the protocol that we started to use. Um, in less than seven, ten days, we had the material here with us. And we are starting to, um, not just to, to send the material to some countries, but we rapidly started to, to make some trainings and workshops. We have a first a workshop in Brazil with like uh, nine countries uh, from South America. And then we had one. We had one in Mex in Mexico, with most of the country from Central America. Uh, we delivered some of the reagents, and finally by um, February 21, we already had like 29 laboratories or in, in 29 countries, the PCR implemented with the, this this protocol um, for again for the PCR that is as you said is the, the, the prioritized uh, test that we are indicating right now. So right now we know that um, actually more than 35 countries in our region uh, have, the, have the capability to perform PCR uh, in their countries. Yeah. Okay, so these 29 countries that we trained and equipped, they're all using the PCR testing with the WHO protocol? Yeah, we can say that actually it was the first protocol that was available and uh, the, the one that had been, that had been suggested by, by WHO. Nevertheless, there are now rapidly uh, more commercial tests were uh, developed based on different protocols. Okay. And those are actually available uh, for, for the countries and the countries are actually can purchase some different platforms depending on the platform they have available. They can, uh, they can actually purchase it, but they are all based in the same principle of the molecular detection, uh, uh, in the, depending of the, of the protocol, but at the same, it's the same uh, principle of uh, genomic detection. May I uh, follow up on that, actually? Please, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. So uh, that's uh, great that, that uh, Jairo was able to tell a little bit of the story. So yes, uh, Paco was, uh, instrumentally providing the first set of tests that was developed at the central level. But then uh, what we want is countries to expand the capacities. As countries have more and more cases, we want them to produce, uh, to have more centers that are able to uh, diagnose. So that's why PAHO has worked with the countries, putting a list of trusted tests because a quality of a test is important. So no old tests, even the molecular tests are created equal. And uh, through a mechanism that PAHO manages called the strategic fund, uh, which actually in normal time procures medicines and tests for other disease for countries, it's allowing countries to procure some of those tests internationally that now, as Hyrule well said, they are, uh, they are prepared uh, by companies. They are manufactured by companies and available in a commercial basis. These tests uh, come as kits, and these kits allow uh, other centers, other than the very sophisticated public center uh, labs that, that Jairo and his team trained during the first stage of the pandemic, to uh, do and perform those tests. So the idea would be that 
countries progressively expands the use of testing to other labs, always under the umbrella of the public health laboratory and with their supervision, so we can bring this PCR test closest to the user, to where we need it. Another great uh, um, you know, initiative that we are actively participating is uh, the, under the umbrella of WHO in Geneva and uh, gathering partners like the Global Fund, the Gavi Alliance and, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, these big players as, as public health donors, uh, they have developed what is called a consortium for procuring commodities that are critical for combating and treating uh, COVID-19. For today's topic, the IVD consortium, which is the in vitro diagnostic consortium, which is the kind of formal name for tests, uh, has been uh, putting together a uh, negotiation with some of the key companies at the worldwide, and PACO is participating. So we will access this test through a very uh, affordable, or at least better pricing that if each country will go by themselves. And then through the strategic fund, PACO will be able to distribute this test, which are of two kinds, the PCR molecular test that Hyra was mentioning that it's called open platform. So they are need, you know, quite a lot of expertise to work. But some of these same technologies can be run in other platforms that are used, for example, for diagnosis of TB or HIV in countries. And the machines are simpler to use. So we will make those uh, tests also available for countries shortly. So we continue to do that. It wasn't just that we trained these 29 labs and then countries are by themselves. We continue to facilitate them to be able to access these these tests at a at a reasonable price so that they're able to then roll it out to their yeah. to their population. Yeah, so, yeah it's it's that's just good. Nice. It's, the, it's the training on one side and the, the, the yeah. strategy with Hyra will talk and then getting the tests to the countries. So yeah. we are working actively on those, yeah. The, and actually the idea is to complement each other so right. the countries are actually going to have all what they need to, to be sure that they can respond. So this, the idea is actually a complement. Okay. Um, and Alia, uh, when it comes to developing the tests for COVID-19, mm -hmm. how tricky is that process? Is that something that had to be developed from scratch? How long does it take for these, for these companies that you were talking about to develop a test? Actually, uh, this is a great question. So Hyro told you the first part of the answer. So first is to I isolate the virus to sequence, which is a fancy word to say exactly what's the, inside the, the virus uh, RNA. And then the test, that is the PCR, all that thinking was done quite quickly, thanks to WHO and the collaborative centers. But once you have that information, it's made public so manufacturers can take that. And then you want them to produce this in a high throughput, a lot of them, but very consistent because you want to make sure each test uh, uh, kind of behaves the same way uh, today and a week from now. Does it, uh, so if it makes sense. So the way we decide is to, uh, how, how to do that is because some manufacturers are vetted, are authorized by some what is called regulatory authorities. Uh, in the countries, which in different in this country in the in the U.S. is called the FDA, in Canada it's Health Canada, and so on and so forth, and these authorities ensure that these manufacturers had the right setting to produce in those tests. So they are inspected and they are authorized, and they kind of have to comp to complete a lot of requirements to ensure the quality. So it takes some time. Fortunately. The, these tests were made available commercially in a, what I would say pretty fast because of the urgency. But now the challenge is to decide what, which ones are quality or not. So PAHO uh, has actually put a set of criteria that are publicly available and had been also sent to the Ministry of Health that are based on what these authorities, regulatory authorities of reference. So which are the best authorities for doing that at the global level, according to WHO. And based on those activities and the tests that are authorized by these authorities, we actually make recommendations to country of what tests to select and to procure. 
In addition, there are other uh, uh, tools that WHO has to do that, uh, and, and, and PAHO, which is some collaborating centers uh, that actually then take this test and do a head-to-head -head performance analysis. So based on those results, we keep on adjusting our recommendations. But in short, all the tests that we have recommended for now, when they were validated by these other centers, are at a hundred percent performance. They're really, really good in the right hands after they get trained by Tyrus people and, and, and the team. So this is what it entails. That's why we, we strongly uh, you know, suggest that very uh, thoughtful process go by before a, a country decides to procure or purchase a, a test to ensure that it's of quality. Right, because certainly there's been, you know, reports in, in various newspapers about certain tests giving false positives or false negatives. Um, how reliable would you say that the results are of these PCR tests? Uh, are, they, are they the same across the board or does it depend on what protocol, to, to use Haider's words, a, a country is using? Actually, in general, PCR is a very sensitive and, and specific test, very accurate. But of course, it, de it depends on how well is designed this PCR. Um, so far, we have, as Natalia was saying, we have several protocols. Um, most of them actually have very, very, very good um, behavior, very good performance. And um, actually, uh, Something that is important is about the sensitivity. Sensitivity is about the false negatives, because um, if you have a false negative, it's worse because you can have a person that actually have actually the virus, and you are going to release, so it's going to be uh, in the society. So um, this is very important. And um, so far, what we what we know about the PCR that we are working with now. Uh, the sensitivity is uh, over 98%, so that means it's very good, but nevertheless, we have to be sure that the, the test not, uh, actually doesn't depend only of the, sens the technical sensitivity of the test, but also depending of the, of the moment of the infection where you take the sample, you can have more or, or, or less viruses, and actually uh, also how well you actually take the sample because uh, you can have the best material, the best PCR, but if the sample uh, actually is not good, you're not going to detect anyway. So it's a combination of several factors when, 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 that you have to, to, to have to account to know about the, the possibility and the, the behavior of the, of, of, of the test. So, but so far what we can say is that it's, the, um, it's very sensitive and very accurate so far. Okay, and I suppose this is why it's so important that the, the guidelines that we publish are followed as well for taking the tests, I'm assuming. Exactly, no, okay. no, to know where, are, uh, where, where to have the best sample, but right. also uh, what, what is actually the best sample, and um, particularly during what days of the disease you can detect better or not the virus. That, mean, that means uh, usually like 24, 48 hours before you start the symptoms and up to seven, eight days after you start the symptoms, you can detect the virus very, very well. So after that, you can detect, uh, it's, it's very low the, the possibility, but you can still detect the virus because of the sensitivity of the test. It, the test is so good the one higher was mentioned at the beginning was developed that it's actually the benchmark for testing the commercial test. So, mm -hmm. uh, and then that you test this commercial test against that protocol developed and, you know, most of the tests uh, that or uh, we're very glad that there's very good quality uh, commercial tests that we can now expand the possibilities of testing for country. But we want to underscore that uh, it's a, all those factors that, that Haido mentioned for the first kind of protocol they would develop. And then with commercial tests, not all are created equally and the quality is needs to be a test authorized by a regulatory authority. And that actually um, 
fulfills all the requirements and technical um, you know, um, requirements that regulatory authorities put for ensure that that test works in the best hands. Yeah. Brilliant. And Haido, who should take a test? Uh, I'm giving you. I'm giving you an easy <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah, very, very easy actually. Um, the idea is to test only um, what we know as a, a suspect case, actually fitting a case definition. That means a person that actually is presenting symptoms uh, or who has some kind of contact, uh, but, but with symptoms anyway. So those are the persons that, are, that should be uh, really tested. As we said at the beginning, testing um, asymptomatics or asymptomatic um, uh, contacts is actually useless because we don't know if even with a negative result, we don't know what that means. So the idea is to, to set the test only for uh, real suspect cases. That means people with uh, symptoms. Right. Okay. Uh, and just a reminder to everyone, so we're coming towards the end of the interview, but if you have any questions, please feel free to pop them in the comments section and we'll get to them as soon as we can. Uh, but before we go, I, I just have a couple more questions. Um, Analia, Haido mentioned that it's very important that we make sure that we're that we're using the tests, the PCR tests, on people that have symptoms. Does that mean that maybe we don't have enough tests to meet current demand? What's the supply and demand situation like? Uh, no, that's an excellent question. So um, it depends on the moment of the epidemiological curve, if I may say. So the moment of the infection at the community level that a country is undergoing. What we've seen in, in most cases in our region that countries started with this uh, test that PAHO provided and slowly we have expanded. As I mentioned before, we want to expand uh, the uh, capacity of the countries for testing so that anyone that described under that criteria that Hiro mentioned, who's symptomatic and their symptoms are compatible with the COVID um, uh, infection, not only the severe cases, any symptomatic COVID patient gets tested. Uh, in order to do that, certainly we need to expand testing capacity. And that's why we keep working through these mechanisms of training to providing these tests uh, through the public centers, public health laboratories, and to making these tests available that are commercially available now to countries. And then to uh, follow, I would say daily, our teams are following the developments of the testing um, field to advise countries which are the best tests and if there's new technologies that can be used to support that. So uh, we uh, seeing countries are at different level of testing, but in all cases, we are seeing mostly countries trying to expand their capacity. Ideally, uh, as I said, anyone that has symptoms should be tested uh, and we repeat because of two reasons you want that person to have access to health care but also you want that person to be diagnosed then the context being follow up and taking the public health measure to isolate or quarantine those people so the infection doesn't spread right now is our best bet of stopping this disease just by isolating the active cases, the one that has the virus is replicating so that can be infected to other people. And the only way to determine that is by testing. Sure. That's why the test, test, test. <laughs> and Analia, yeah, we know that, you know, globally, certainly, and our region is no exception, there's, you know, lots of, no two health systems are equal. So when it comes to ensuring that everyone everywhere has access to a test. You know, I guess we're talking about economics as well as health. How are we trying to ensure that? That's an excellent question. And it goes back to some of the other initiatives. So we've proven with other technologies, even in normal times, that when countries get together, especially middle income countries, like most of our countries in the region, get together and together negotiate 
or go for and procure together, it's called pool procurement, in which the strategic fund is based on, they get better, better pricing at the global level. This actually has been uh, such a good example for other regions that it got to the creation of the IVD consortium that I was discussing before. So, um, and I think uh, we are at a point that testing is such an effective way of controlling the expansion of the virus in a community that uh, it's one of the best investments the countries can do. So uh, when you have such a dire crisis, you wanna know what to invest your money on because you don't have money for everything. But testing has been proven to be a way out of this uh, vicious cycle of infection and, and disease because you can, as I said, not only treat the person but isolate them and, and prevent the spread. So we would like to propose that testing is one of the best investments countries can do and expanding the capacity, even if the cost might seem staggering at that time for the number of samples you have to do. There is no specific treatment for COVID right now. COVID patients are treated with very good treatment for supported care, but nothing that will target the virus. None of these medicines that are supposedly now being publicized as being for, good for COVID have been proven without doubt that they are. That's why there are clinical trials to you know, figure this one out. But for now, testing has been proven to be a good strategy with the public health measures. So that's why we need to work on that. Right. And that, and that brings me on to my final question, really, before we go to the audience questions, which we know that, you know, there's been a lot of treatments and, and things that have been touted as the, the next big thing. And, you know, certainly WHO is, is very busy carrying out the rigorous testing that needs to be carried out as part of the solidarity trial. But when do you both expect to see a vaccine or an effective treatment for COVID-19? I know I'm asking you to predict the future, but... But, you know, have you seen any progress? Are there areas which look particularly interesting or are we still, you know, very much in the early stages and not able to say? Well, actually, this, this, is, this is, of course, an, an answer for, for Analia, but I just want to say that um, particularly with, with this kind of viruses that we still don't know how are going to, uh, to evolve and, uh, and other things, it's kind of difficult to predict how, how easy it's going to be to have a vaccine. And there are many challenges and many steps to have a good vaccine. So, um, yeah, it is um, it's not easy at all. But probably uh, Analia can, uh, of course, uh, say a little bit more about that. Now you said the bad, the the, the difficult part. So thank you for that title. <laughs> now, uh, so I'm going to try to be on the positive side. Well, last time we counted, there were more than a hundred uh, candidate vaccines on on the pipeline, and some of them are been uh, moving ahead. At, uh, amazing speed into even start, initial uh, set of clinical uh, testing. But um, remember a vaccine is something you put in a healthy person to prevent a disease. So you wanna make sure first a disease is uh, vaccine is safe. And that takes a lot of testing because you don't wanna create a problem bigger than the disease. So, you know, the vaccines needs to be first and foremost safe. So the, uh, there's a lot of emphasis when you would do clinical trials for vaccines on that part. And then the difficulty is, is to make the vaccine effective. Yeah, and the effectiveness needs to be uh, proven. It, it doesn't take a day, it takes a few days. But I think what it's heartening is the fact that there are so many people at the global level working together, which is unprecedented. This consortium, uh, that I was mentioning for IVD, there are similar initiatives for research. Today in Geneva, there was a big um, um, online, of course, meeting on uh, countries, head of states pledging to work together, not only for the development of the vaccine, but also to make this vaccine equitable and accessible to all. This is unprecedented. It hasn't happened in other, in other time even for us who have been in public health for a while. So we're very heartening that the vaccine will come. And when it comes, it will be available to all those in need. In the meantime, 
our best bet is to test and isolate the cases that are active to keep the public health measures and try to comply with them as best as possible and um, try to flatten the curve and, and do all these things that are helping countries to get out of the worst uh, you know, situations. So. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, thank you both. We just have a few questions from the audience. So I'll just I'll go in order that we received them. Uh, so we had a question from Vic Bal, and I, I think this might be from be for Hyro, but, but jump in, Analia, if not. Uh, they want to know if we have the exact percentage of false negatives for the PCR tests. Yeah, again, the, that means the sensitivity of the test. And uh, again, it's over, depending on the protocol, but it's over 98%, depending on the, the PCR protocol and the design. Um, in ter biological terms, it means to detect as low as 10 uh, genetic in, um, in one microliter of sample. So that's actually very low. And that means that it's very sensitive. So in terms of in, in percentage, again, is over 98%. Okay. And that's 98% reliable. Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Just only, to emphasize that. Again, <laughs> only only, 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 only uh, taking into account the technical issues. Again, it depends on the moment of the disease where you take the sample. It depends on how well you actually took the sample. And there are many other factors. But for the, 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 the protocol as, uh, per se, the, 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 the sensitivity is around 98%. Okay, thank you, Jairo. And I think this next one might be for you, Analia, and it's from Arancha Cachon. Uh, and she asks, what are the main challenges for countries now? And how is PAHO providing support? Uh, yeah, I think we address some of those challenges through this conversation, but I'm happy to, to, to summarize. Uh, one is to expand their testing capacity. Yes. So I think I mentioned that we are doing one through uh, a lot of the training that Jairo and his team is performing with the countries, and two, by providing extra tests through these commercial available tests at an affordable price, or at least a better price than they would if they go by, by themselves, so that every lab that has the capacities can perform those tests closest to the user. So that's one. The second one, I think it's a little bit, it's not a challenge per se, but it be, has become a challenge, and it's the title of our talk today, this confusion of what are rapid tests, what are PCR tests, and I know there's a lot of anxiety to finding ways around the PCR, but as, as today, unfortunately, if any, there's none. But it's, uh, and the rapid tests with, on the serology side are not yet uh, an option for that. I want to make a caveat for that. There are some rapid tests evolving around the world that are molecular. So we are hopefully that might be an alternative sometime down the road for having a test in five minutes, but that works like Hyra was describing. So, but this is the next chapter and that's how we work. And last but not least is uh, having then uh, what to do with those patients that are infected. And, uh, and, and this comes to the whole other work that PAHO does that we are not discussing here today on health systems and access to health services are having the best care for those patients that do get sick. And there's a lot of immense work that's done by other teams and, and our colleagues, making sure that access to services and the guidelines to treat those patients are the best we can manage. And, and we advise the expertise for that to happen. And um, if, if I may, I, I want to complement saying another thing that I think is an um, important challenge now for the countries. And it's because we are facing an important uh, shortage of material, of some of the material that we need for the whole process. Mm -hmm. um, the PCR is only like the final step, actually. But for to go to the PCR, we have to take a sample. And once you have to, to, to take the sample, you have to extract the, the RNA, the genetic material, and then go for the PCR. And we are facing right now, because of course, of, of the, the, the high demand that we have globally, we have a very important shortage in 
the first that you need to take the sample to, to sell the, 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 the swabs, that you need to take the sample. There is an important shortage right now, uh, in, and it's a challenge, a very important challenge in, in many countries. And then for the second step, which is the destruction of the material, we also have a very important shortage of this kind of uh, material or, or extraction kits. So this is something that we are working uh, here from PAHO. We are trying to, to obtain, to, to work with different providers. So to see if we can uh, obtain some material to, so we can support the countries uh, in this uh, important challenge. Um, this is what, what, what Analia was saying. So something important to have in mind. Brilliant. Thank you, Haido. And Haido, I, I know you've mentioned this before, but we've had a question from Zunilda Nunez. Uh, so perhaps you'd just like to repeat it very quickly. And she wanted to know, when is the best time to do PCR? You mentioned from X day to X day. I wonder if you could repeat that for us. Please. Yeah. Actually, um, we know that we can detect uh, the, the, the virus actually like 24, 48 hours before uh, you actually present the symptoms. But once you have the, the symptoms, you can detect the virus for up to eight days and even more depending on the patient. But to say the best moment or the best day to, to actually detect is going to be between the day three, four, up to this day seven is where we have seen the, 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 the best detection actually that we have seen. Okay, and then I have uh, just one final question and then we'll say goodbye today. Um, so it's from Fernando Diaz Bruni uh, and he's asked, there are other RNA polymerase producing viruses. Can they be detected by this same PCR that we're using for COVID-19? Um, I'm not sure about that question. Um, I'm going to say if they're talking about the polymerase gene, it, it could be detected because one of the, of the molecular targets that we have tested in our protocols is actually the gene for one polymerase. Uh, so I'm not sure if he's talking about that. If that's so, it's been actually um, validated and we know that the, the test that we are using only detects the polymerase of the COVID-19 viruses. It doesn't detect the other coronaviruses uh, uh, gene, if it is what the, what the question is about. Okay, okay. Well, thank you both so much for joining us today for your second your second Facebook Live about tests. We'll be doing the same thing but with a different subject next Friday, uh, again in Spanish and then in English. So please tune in again. Uh, but thank you very much, Analia and Jairo, and we'll hopefully catch up soon virtually, social distancing. Yeah.